Sam, welcome to the show. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? Very good. So let's give some context to the listeners. Who are you? What do you do? And what's a bit, a bit of your background? Because I know you do so much. Okay. Um, I'm a PGA golf professional. Um, I played full time for about ten years on uh, the what was then the Euro Pro Tour and a few of the mini tours. Played a little bit out in Australia. Um, did my PGA training and then got into coaching golfers, uh, sort of traditional swing coaching. Um, was drawn more and more to the to the mental side of the game, um, based around my experience with with playing. And then that has taken me from golf into other sports. So I do, do some work in rugby, football, cricket, um, and in some schools as well. So you, how, how far did you take your game? Um, I had a reasonable amateur career, I suppose. I got to the final of the English amateur in 1995, um, then turned pro and was just not quite good enough. Um, played, as I say, probably three or four seasons on the Euro Pro Tour. And, you know, my contemporaries were Luke Donald, Lee Westwood, David Howell, uh, those guys. And, you know, they were just better than me. And I, I, you know, I was a decent ball striker, but there was something else. And I think that's the, the thing that's probably mystifying to most good golfers who don't make it. What's that, what's that difference? And that sort of curiosity around that was what led me into learning more and more about, um, about the mind, about, uh, the human experience and has led me to, to, to where I am today in terms of, of, of talking to people about, about how they feel and how they think and, and what's going on with them, really. I thought um, I'd just bring up a quote from uh, a, one of your books. As I know you're an author as well. This one's from uh, The Free Principles, and it says, My strongest memory of playing tournaments was feeling sick and nerves pretty much every time I teed it up. I was happiest when I was practising. I love hitting golf balls and working on my swing or short game. Practising wasn't accomplished by the pressure of what I felt when I was playing. So when you're sort of competing against the likes of Lee Westwood and Luke Donald, what was the difference between uh, the moments when you were sort of teeing it up in a tournament-like scenario and when you were just practising and having fun? Just that, really, mate. Um, you know, tor- tournaments were a, a an experience that I didn't enjoy and what I did enjoy was was practicing and, and playing on my own or um, with friends. And I I didn't understand then why I was feeling the way that I was feeling. And I spent some time going to see a number of different sort of mental coaches and sports psychologists who gave me different things to do, relaxation takes techniques, routines, visualizations, um, always pointing to, to the idea that, that my experience was something that, that I needed to cope with, that I needed to mitigate those, those feelings. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes it works. Sometimes I felt better. Um, but it didn't seem to do the trick for, for long. Um, so, you know, within a few weeks, I'd, I'd wind up feeling the same way again, feeling feeling nervous and anxious and insecure, and 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 not playing my the golf that I knew that I was capable of playing. So, with, with that in mind, how, what, what lessons have you drawn from it going ahead? And I guess this is an element of your teaching with some of the clients you work with today. Yeah, v- very much so. So. There's there's t- <laughs> there's two ways of looking at it. We can I- we can either jump straight in the deep end or we can paddle around in the shallow end for a bit. Um, I'm happy to take so the trunks in and let's go for it. <laughs> okay, so the the way that human beings experience the world is not how we think it is. So when we look outwards towards the world. We believe that it's the world that's making us feel a certain way. So, for example, 
the theory is that or, or the, the suggestion would be that that uh, being on the first tee can make you feel nervous or that being sat in traffic can make you feel frustrated and it's we're, we're led to believe that there's a causal relationship between the situation or circumstance of our lives and 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 the way we feel about it now the, the as I say, when if somebody's suffering, it's generally because they've got a belief that isn't true. But unfortunately, these beliefs are so we're so conditioned into these beliefs, and they're so prevalent in society that we don't we don't stop to question them. We 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 have a a, a a vast array of assumptions that we've made about stuff, and we we don't we don't question. Them. Um, so th- the first conversation that I might have with a golfer is, well, do you always feel nervous on the first tee? And if there has ever been a time where you've stood on the first tee of a golf course and not felt nervous, then the exception proves that it's there's no causal relationship between that situation and how you're feeling. If you've ever come down the stretch in a tournament and felt happy and confident and relaxed, that gives a lie to the idea that coming down the stretch in contention can make you feel nervous, insecure or anxious because – if it was a causal relationship, it would happen 100% of the time, and that's not true. So that that's the first thing that, that I would suggest that, that, that we do when we start chatting about our experience and, and what's going on there, how, we, how we're feeling and, and the relationship between our thoughts and our feelings is let's look at the beliefs that you've got about yourself and about life and, and just query whether you're making any assumptions there which are getting in the way of you a enjoying yourself and b playing the golf that you're capable of playing. So, would, would, I mean, guessing one of the first stages would just to write some of these these beliefs and assumptions down uh, on a bit of paper and sort of sort of stare them in the face and really get to understand a bit of who you are and what what you believe in. Possibly. Um, again, what I what I do is 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 slightly different in that I don't. There's no strategy. There's no technique. There's no to-do list with with any of this. It's you know the last thing that I want any of the people that I talk to to do is 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 take my beliefs as as truth and and adopt them for themselves. This is all about questioning your beliefs. So again, for me to tell, I I, I don't tell anybody to do anything. I just we, we just have a conversation and then see what insights and 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 to do's if anything come out for them in in that moment that makes sense to them in that moment their their insights about the best way to proceed are going to be much more appropriate to them than anything that I could come up with so for me it's about asking maybe asking different questions than they've asked themselves or that people have asked them in the past rather than trying to come up with any answers for them Hmm. okay that makes sense the I know you, you you've touched a bit on sort of the mentality of someone like Ian Poulter in your book as a as a prime example of someone who perhaps stays out of his head or maybe certain beliefs and uh, plays with a lot of just imagination and calmness. Is is Ian Poulter a good example or reference in terms of what you're talking about? Um, I'm I'm not sure. Again, I would never tell a golfer to model themselves on it on anybody else because you're you, mm. and you're you're going to be much better off being you than you are trying to be somebody else. Um, we all we're all a, 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 our bodies and our minds they 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 they're conditioned by our experiences. So the the experience that Ian's had throughout his career are, are, are have conditioned the way that he thinks his habits of of thought and his habits of behavior and and they work really well for him and and at the end of the day that's that's what this is about it's about finding what works for you not you know golf is a wonderful sport in 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 the fact that we've got this vast library of literature and information and knowledge about the game um but just taking on somebody else's beliefs or somebody else's habits or somebody else's um, prescription technique or strategy or whatever that that to me doesn't doesn't get you very far you're much better off stripping away knowledge until you find out you get you get to the source of of of, of where your 
wisdom comes from and going with what you what you feel is right and what what feels right to you in your gut not not trying to model yourself on on somebody else or 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 something that you've read a belief that you've picked up from somewhere else i guess that's that's uh, almost hard to do uh, in in today's sort of period of time was with so much information being sort of available uh, especially uh, so quickly um, it's easier just to to model yourself on someone else or model yourself on someone else's beliefs or behaviors um, because you can gain that information or insights quicker than ever before um, absolutely yeah um, so I guess going back to that how, how does how does the what the golfer himself sort of look at his own beliefs and and really pay attention to them okay so so as I say, any any time that a golfer is struggling, so if you're feeling anxious or you're feeling frustrated or you're feeling um, upset or angry, it, ask ask yourself what 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 beliefs would I need to hold for me to have the thinking that gives rise to the feelings that I'm having. So if you're for example, if you're feeling angry or frustrated on the golf course, the most likely cause would be that you've got some expectations about how you think reality should be and the reality that you're experiencing is not matching up to your, your expectations. So you've got a belief about how life should be and about what your experience should be like and, and reality doesn't match up with that which that which which causes you to feel the way that you feel so you know reality is what it is regardless of how we want it to be um so we've got two options either you can try and change reality which is unfortunately what most people try to do um or you can question the beliefs that are, are, are causing the, 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 the problem in the first place which to me seems like a uh, a much simpler and more efficient way of of, of addressing the, the you know the experience that you're having. So just take a, a belief uh, as an example. Say um, I don't shoot the scores that perhaps I used to in the past. Yeah. Um, so that's that's perhaps uh, a golfer being aware of a a belief. It's fact. Um, and then I guess. Knowing that information, he, he could either act on it. Is that in terms of you sort of acting it in terms of reality? Or does he just become aware of it? How, how does he... Because obviously the golfer at the end of the day wants to become better. Um, well, again, so again, that's, that's, that's quite a common belief, which is that in order for me to enjoy the golf, enjoy my golf, I need to get better. And that's, that belief is, is what's trapping a lot of people in a less than enjoyable um, experience of the game, if you want to put it like that. Um, it, it's what's fed to us by the golf instruction industry, which is that, you know, the holy grail is, is lower scores and, 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 and better performance, and that will lead to greater enjoyment. But if we look back to when we started the game, most people would say that, you know, if you ask most people when they enjoyed the game the most, it was when they were children. Well, most people, when they were children, weren't particularly good golfers. They were certainly not as most of us weren't as good as, as as we were, you know, when we got a little bit older and got a little bit stronger and more skillful. But so this, again, this idea that enjoyment is 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 there's a causal relationship between your performance and the enjoyment of the game. That's not true either. That's another belief, and and as I say, that's one that that really does kind of keep us trapped because we're constantly you know the game always looks like you can improve if you you know if you shoot if you if, if you shoot 70 you want to shoot 69 if you shoot 69 you want to shoot 68 if you get your handicap to 10 you want to get it to nine so the 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 game is set up to feed the the, the primary sort of feature of the ego which is seeking or resisting you know what gets in the way of our happiness is is searching for happiness it's it's a it's like a, a mirage it's like a it's like a trick that the mind plays on us so what what's everybody looking for from golf um they're looking for a, a good feeling they're looking for happiness they're looking for enjoyment and 
the problem is that we've been drawn into this belief or this assumption that performance leads to enjoyment and it's just worth asking the question whether that's true for some people that's how it looks and and they've made a decision that the only way that they can enjoy golf is by shooting certain scores well if if that's how the game looks to you then you need to prepare yourself that you're going to have some uh, you're going to have some rough times as well as the good ones when you do manage to 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 meet your expectations so what 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 does uh, how do you define success in terms of a golfer mate i can't that's again that's that's one of those questions that i wouldn't i wouldn't dream of going near um I, I can tell you what it what it looks like for me, but each every golfer would need to yep. to, to answer that question for them for themselves. Um, for me, it's enjoyment, it's happiness. If I'm enjoying if I'm enjoying the game, you know, I don't play nearly as well as I as I perhaps did four or five years ago, just because I don't play as much as I did. Um, and but I still hit enough good shots to go out there and enjoy it, and I enjoy it for different reasons now. Um, you know, I just like being outside and, and letting my mind wander. And um, I play a, a beautiful golf course, which is always in really good condition. And there's some nice people around. And that that that's you know that's that's my experience of the game now. Rather than you know, I remember shooting some low scores in the past and and walking off the golf course and, and you know being the overwhelming feeling was relief that it was over. So that's that's very much down to sort of that you know, a relationship with whatever you do, isn't it? it it's, it's so it it is, but it's also down to this is where we're going to go into the deep end a little bit. It's also down to the relationship you've got with with yourself. So who you, who you think you are? So our 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 cultural con- our, our conditioning, our, our societal and con- top con- uh, and cultural conditioning is that who we're referring to when we say the words I am. So I am Sam. Well, who or what is Sam? Most people believe that who they are is a body and a mind. So there's a physical element to it, but there's also a a, a mental element to it. There's 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 thoughts, feelings, perceptions, and sensations. But when we look at when we look more closely at that, what we what we see is when we when we turn inwards rather than looking outwards at the content of our experience, but we turn inwards and look at the nature of our experience, we see that there's there's actually something different going on. All we know is knowing. All we know is awareness. Everything else within our experience is either a thought, a feeling, a sensation, or a perception. There's nothing physical there. There's nothing physical about it. So we know, you know, we've we've had from our experience, we know that we can be fooled by our thoughts, our feelings, our perceptions and our sensations. If you've ever, you know, thought you've seen your friend across on another fairway and waved and found that they weren't who you thought they were, or if you've ever been sat on a train and another train next to you moves out and you have the feeling of, of movement, you know that you can be fooled by sensations. So, you know, perceptions aren't 100%, sensations aren't 100%. Well, we all know that our thoughts can fool us. You know, we can be asleep and, and you know, having a really terrifying dream and wake up and we find that we're in our own bed. So our, um, our, our mentations, our, our thinking can, can, can trick us. So, the the reality which we take for granted as something solid as something real for in inverted commas it isn't what we think it is and the first or the, or the biggest steps that, that i found in my own experience and that i have with the people that i work with is when we start to question that and who who we really are in terms of our experience because if we don't know who we are how can we take stock of of our interactions with other people with the game of golf and with 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 life itself it's a it's a much deeper question than than just looking at golf but you know what I've come to see is that if we don't look at 
what's known as metaphysics, so the, the wider picture, who we really are, what is the nature of reality, what is the meaning of life. If we get those some clarity around those things, then, you know, the, the art of hitting a small white ball into a hole with a stick, that's easier to get in perspective if we've got the, some of the big questions out of the way. So that's really going quite deep on a on a on a sort of macro scale to, as you said, from hitting it just a little white golf ball on around a field. It is, and and look, this isn't a conversation for everybody. Some people are very happy just hitting a ball around uh, a, a field with a stick, and and like I say, this isn't this isn't for me to say what you should or shouldn't be getting from golf, but for people who have really lost their love for the game or are experiencing a lot of frustration or a lot of anger or a lot of disappointment or just um you know even boredom around the game this to me is the is is the only direction worth looking because we've tried everything else we've tried swing fixes we've tried golf lessons we've tried you know, psychological techniques and strategies, routines, visualizations. We've tried golf fitness. We've tried diet. We've tried reading books. We've tried watching YouTube videos. We've, 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 we've. You know, most of these guys who are really frustrated with the game have gone right through the whole raft of of trying to fix their experience, of trying to fix their reality. And at some point, they just get to a point where they go, "Look, I've had enough of this, and I I want to look in a different direction." I think that's very common with. Uh especially with golfers, because it's such a time-invested game, uh, they do get sick with it because they're not seeing sort of a result in a, in a linear-like method or fashion. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, well, that's, that's a good example to perhaps pick on. Um, so say if someone is, is aware of this um, and after sort of maybe jotting it down in a journal or, um, or, or come up with some feelings, how, how do they take that to the next stage, uh, and develop it, look into it a little bit further. Well, as I say, the first the first thing is to is is to to make a decision what you're going to trust. Are you going to trust your beliefs, which, if we're honest, are generally somebody else's beliefs, or are we gonna are we gonna trust our own experience? Are we gonna are we gonna question our assumptions about ourselves and about life and about about the game? So. You know, in terms of, of let's take a, a a pre-shot routine as an as an example of, of of things that people kind of do and get caught up in, and they believe that you know we're 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 sold the idea that a pre-shot routine. Sorry if you can hear a bit of whining in the background. That's my dog. Um, so we're we're told that having a pre-shot routine is the key to to hitting better golf shots. Well, that's a belief. Now, is that backed up by experience? Well, if you've ever used a pre-shot routine and not hit any good shots or not hit a good shot, then that you know calls into question that belief that a pre-shot routine is 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 the key to to hitting you know better, more consistent golf shots. And we can go right through you know the whole range of of, of things that a lot of us believe about the game of golf and, and about what we need to do in order to play well and we just see that actually most of these are correlations that you know if there is a correlation there it's probably quite a weak one and actually the idea that this there's there's a causal relationship here is is not true it's wrong hmm. so so as I say, my my first step would be, as I say, decide decide what you're going to trust. Are you going to trust your own experience, or are you going to keep on looking outside and reading more and more books and watching more and more videos and and taking more and more lessons, or are you going to, as I say, turn inwards and start to ask some 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 deeper questions about about yourself and about what it is that you believe? So, in terms of trusting your experience, what did, what do you mean by that exactly? Well. As I say, like, are you going to trust the belief that a pre-shot routine can cause you to hit better golf shots, or are you going to question your experience and go down the range and hit some shots without using a pre-shot routine and see what happens? Are they genuinely? Are they? Are they? You know, when you use your pre-shot routine, do you hit a good shot 100% of the time? I would suggest people don't. 
when you go down the range with your mates and you're just hitting some balls, you know, a lot of us, a lot of us don't use our normal pre-shot routine and we actually hit some very good golf shots. So what does that tell us about the, 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 the function and the, and the importance of a pre-shot routine? That's, that's our experience telling us one thing, which is contrary to our beliefs. That's interesting. So you're almost discovering your own path or creating your own model, your own book. Exactly. Of finding what works for you. Exactly. Rather and that's than perhaps being system oriented and being stuck in the system of what the system is trying to tell you to do. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And and the, the you know, it's like to me it's like peeling it's like peeling layers off off an onion. You know, you're we if, if you ask people when they play their best golf, what are they thinking about, most people would say very little. If you ask them how they feel when they play well, it's it's they feel free. They feel happy. They feel lighthearted. They, you know, they, they, it's almost like they're they're not there. Whereas we're our belief is, or if you read books and magazines, we're told that we need to be in control. We need to grind. We need to concentrate. We need to focus. You know, none of those things are in our experience in the moment of where, when we're doing them. That may be how it looked to us. When we look back on a, on, a, on a round we played well in hindsight, it may look like, oh, I was really focused. But in the moment of doing that, you, weren't, you didn't know that you were focused because you were in the moment. Mm. And, and what, we actually, what we're actually experiencing there, it's like when we fall asleep. Sleep is not the absence of awareness. It's the awareness of absence. It's the, it's the fact that the ego, the, the separate self, who we think of as, as, as I, isn't there anymore. And that's, you know, that's what the flow state to me is, is all about. It's, 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 it's just a, a sense of oneness with the game, the absence of the ego, the absence of the, central, the, 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 the separate self, if you want to put it like that, the absence of anybody, of, a, of, a, of an entity that's controlling. It's just the, the experience of the game is just unfolding in the only way that it can. It, it, you know, it almost, you know, you, you're, you've been a really good player, mate. So you probably had that experience where it just unfolds. It's almost, it almost feels magical. It almost feels like you're not doing it. It's just unfolding. I was going to say, when the, the moments when you're really playing your best, you're not really thinking about the swing tip you've read in a magazine or the, the mental question your psychologist asks you to say before a shot. You're, yeah. you're merely just, um, uh, you're in the now, you're just completely present with it and it's just unfolding in front of you. Um, exactly. So on, on well, whilst that is all fascinating, the humans are also like very interested of learning and always growing. So there's a bit of, of always reading, always trying to seek new information, always expanding your knowledge. But then on the contrary of this is almost is letting, uh, you know, shedding all of this information off at the same time and not being attached to it. So how does one, yeah. how does one sort of uh, gain in knowledge, uh, which is very instinctive for all of us, we all like to, to grow and, and learn and read more through experiences or just through learning, um, but then also sort of touch on what you've just said and just almost let go of that at the same time. Yeah, I mean, we again. This is pointing to you know. You said they're human beings like to learn. Well, again, it comes back to the question of what is a human being? Um, is it is it the body and the mind, or is it the awareness of the body and the mind? Is it is it awareness? Is it consciousness? Is it knowing? Now, learning is to me something which is in, instinctive if we have an experience then we'll, we'll learn from it there's no need for a third party a separate self an ego to be there supervising the learning experience now there's nothing wrong with watching youtube videos or reading books or you know i've 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 picked up some really useful information about the golf swing that that, that you know, has has perhaps I've incorporated at some point, but it, it, it's like if you intellectual knowledge is not the same as as understanding. If I gave you a book to read about riding a bike, 
and you read it from cover to cover and you intellectually understood every single word and every single nuance of, of, of each paragraph, that still doesn't mean you can ride a bike. The only way to ride a bike is to get a bike and get on it and get out there and, and experience it. Um, and I think a lot of golfers get caught in the trap of, of not of reading, seeing that, like. yeah, that intellectual, you know, believing that intellectual understanding, you know, it's, it's why quite a lot of, 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 of golf teachers out there can't break 80 and that's not knocking them because a lot of them you know they prefer teaching and they spend a lot of time on the range and 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 that's what they do but and they've got you know they've got a a, a, an encyclopedic knowledge of the golf swing but that doesn't mean they can do it whereas you see you know you see these amazing little six-year-old kids on youtube with perfect golf swings just smashing the ball miles how much intellectual understanding do you think that kid's got of 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 the golf swing he couldn't write a book on it but he can certainly hit the ball really well yeah that's uh we had a guest on here um previously called ross mckenzie and he actually explained a very similar uh metaphor about riding a bike and i think he was touching on uh you know how getting out of your head um, you know, you, when you're riding a bike, for example, you're not you're not thinking about where my right knee needs to be in relevance to the foot, or you know, where my, exactly you are just simply just going through the motions and experiencing it as as you see it. Yeah. Okay, so this um, I guess this is all I mean, what so this is all fascinating, but uh, the this I, I like to see this. Um, as a very sort of actionable for the listeners. Um, so <laughs> I was waiting for this bit, mate. <laughs> um, so I, this, I mean, this is something which perhaps is going to be a slightly different episode for the listeners in the sense that this may this may just take more time uh, for them to start to sort of learn and experience about this and, and themselves, because obviously they they could say that, you know, after a round of golf, they collect their data, uh, number of fairways hit, you know, left or right, long or short, all of this information. Um, but perhaps what you're maybe trying to get them to do is maybe just ask the question, um, and this is not for everyone, but, you know, is this is this helpful or, you know, is this, is, is this assumption or belief which I currently have um, actually helpful to me? And, and look, data, you know, data can be, data can be really helpful. Um, let's use that as an example. I mean, that could be anything in, in terms yeah. of... Yeah. Well, well, let's use the data as an example. You know, if you believe, for example, if, you've, if, if you believe that you can hit a seven iron 160 yards through the air, if that's your belief, and you come to a par three and it's a 160 yard carry to the front of the green over water and the pins on the front, you pull your six iron out and you splash it. Well, your belief that you hit the, you, that you hit a six iron that you hit, sorry, you hit a set of seven iron 160 yards wasn't true. You don't. So the knowledge, you know, getting back and going on track, man, and, and hitting a load of balls and taking, the, you know, not your best shot, but the average and finding that you actually carry it 153 yards consistently that's really useful information and that will change a belief that you've got which will then hold you in good stead on the golf course similarly if you you know if you if you watch if you watch the the top golfers play and you know you you're you're watching sunday afternoon you're watching the best golfers playing their absolute best and it looks like they're they're hitting every single shot stone dead well Again, Mark, you know, I, I love Mark, Mark Brody's book. Um, was it Every, Every Shot Counts, I think it's called. And, and if you look at the, the actual statistics for how far, you know, players hit the ball or how close players hit the ball, I think, you know, the best wedge player on the PGA Tour from between 75 and 100 yards hits it to about 12 or 13 feet every time. Well, if you're beating yourself up because you play once a week and you've just hit a wedge shot to 20 feet or something – because you think you've hit a really bad golf shot, well, that's 
as I say, that's a mistaken belief that's causing you to feel a certain way, which needn't because it's actually not that bad a shot compared with the best players in the world. Mm. Yeah. So that, that that's very much in line with a false belief, isn't it? <clears throat> but it's, it, as I say, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> um, you know, what's a false belief and what's a belief? It's still a belief. It's, 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 yeah, I, I see where you. I see where you're going. It's it's you, you. You know, any 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 data that you've got that that allows you to to match up your expectations closer with reality is going to help you. And the the opposite is true. So yeah, the how, how, so what is the best way about validating a belief? Just again through your experience. Okay. That's why, as I say, that's why. The, the amount of data that's available now with you know launch monitors is 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 so useful because you you're not guessing anymore you're you know if you've if you've got a belief that the reason that you're hitting a a particular shot is because of something in your golf swing the impact factors you can very quickly get on a launch monitor and find out whether that's true or not and that allows you to make adjustments to what you're doing much quicker it allows the body and the mind to become a you know conditioned to what you want to do much more efficiently if i think back to when i was learning the game this is probably say you know at least 30 years ago you'd go for a lesson and and you, you know you'd be hitting shots and the pro basically guessing about what he thinks is happening he can't you know He's he's looking at the ball flight, and you know that's why the best teaching pros in those days were the best teaching pros because they had a better instinct for what was actually happening with 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 the club face and and the ball uh, uh, impact. You know they they weren't guessing. Whereas you know the ball goes right, and the pro says, "Oh, you know you you got a little bit ahead of that one." Well. How helpful is that? You know, now he can go, well, yeah, your club face was three degrees open. That's why I went right. Mm. So so having that feedback and having that, that information allows us to to overcome those those erroneous beliefs much more efficiently. Mm. Well, I, I, yeah, I think that, that is it's all very – I find that all very fascinating and it's something which um, which has actually come up multiple times now on this podcast and I think – uh, lots of people are starting to become more aware of this sort of way of thinking. Um, I do want to touch on uh, your two books, if um, we could possibly sort of yeah. um, touch on them. I know you, the, the first one was The Three Principles, is that correct? Three Principles of Outstanding Golf, yeah. So that, I, I wrote that, it started off as 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 an article for my website. I'd... Um, I'd just been out to New York to meet up with my the guy who, who coached me, my mentor, a guy called Garrett Kramer, who um, works with a number of, of PGA Tour players, and he's also works with NHL players, NBA players, a lot of American sort of sports, American athletes. Um, and I'd, I'd really just – so the first, if you like, the first real insight for me was, was seeing the – a lack of a connection between my thoughts and my feelings. So I, I'd spent my whole golf career believing that golf was making me feel the way that I, that I felt about it. And the, the first insight was, was, you know, was, was Garrett pointing to my experience, to, to my experience and saying, well, look, do you always feel like that? And, and the answer was no. And he was like, well, it can't be golf that's making you feel that way then, because if one day coming down the stretch, you feel all right, but, most of the other days, you know, you feel nervous and anxious. It's actually not the situation that's causing you to feel that. So, I'd been out to um, been out to, to New Jersey to to spend some time with him, and I was on the plane on the way back and started writing this article for my website, and uh, it just kind of kept going and, and eventually turned into into the first book, um, and then. You know, my understanding has has moved on quite significantly since I finished that um, and the second book which is called Take Relief is you know almost like the next step on on that journey on that on that on that evolution if you want to call it that of my understanding um, pointing more towards what what I discussed about the, the nature of, of who we really are of what is our what is the true nature of our experience 
And then the third book, which is is currently underway, um, I'm hoping to to get that out next year sometime. That will be the the, the, the latest step on that on that journey of of looking towards, um, yeah, what is the what is the source of our experience? What's the fundamental element of reality? Uh, which one would you like to uh, touch on if, if we were to sort of focus on one for a little bit? Um, mate, I'm, I'm easy. Um, is there anything in either of the books that you that you particularly would, would like to, to talk about? I mean, the, as I say, the first book is probably a little bit more accessible for, for people to start with, um, but you can read the second one without reading the first one. Um, the second one is more kind of touching on the conversation we've had today talking about it's, it's called Take Relief, the, the Myths and Misunderstandings of Golf Performance. So it, it does pretty much what we've described today in terms of um, encouraging golfers to look at the, you know, some of the, the, the common um, common knowledge or, or common beliefs that many golfers have and, and calling those into question. So if if today's conversation is is a is a is a step on the path that you'd like to take, then the second book is probably a, a good place to start. But as I say, the uh, the first one from the feedback I have, um the, the first one seems to be a, a good jumping off point for a lot of people. Mm. Um yeah there, there's just a, a couple of things in the in the first one. It, the I, there's something that I keep seeing over and over again is sort of how some of the best players in the world shoot 65 one day and then followed by 75 the next day. Uh, I know you sort of touched on that briefly in the three principles. I was wondering why you think that is. Um, because they don't... Um, how can I put this without... Um, I think that there can be any number of reasons. Um, the obvious one would be would be expectations. So they played well one day, and then they've got thinking going on about the round that they played yesterday, which means they're they're less present than they were the day before. So the previous day they just showed up um, and played, and a good score has 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 unfolded. And then the second day they go out and they perhaps try and do the same thing as as the thing that they were doing the previous day. And you know, human beings, we, we're not very good at, at at seeing time for what it really is. We have this concept of time that there's a past, there's a present, and there's a future, which is not how we experience it. We only ever experience the present moment. So if you're constantly comparing your current experience with either a previous experience or a future experience, then you're not going to be very present. You're going to be flitting between thoughts and, and as I say, what's going on right now. So that probably gets in the way of of them just turning up and allowing whatever it was that they did the previous day to uh, to unfold. Mm. No, I've always um, I've always found that interesting, especially looking you know at the scoreboard. Especially when someone goes really low, it's always uh, backed up necessarily with a a more considerable round, but that makes total sense the way you described it. Um, there was another bit in the book which you said, um, why is it that some 15 handicappers who turn up to my studio can really hit a 250-yard drive down the fairway or repeatedly hit a 7-iron from 150 yards to you know, to a pin or a very small practice screen but struggle to break 90 when they have a medal card in their round? Yeah, so that, that again comes down to the belief about about who they are. So when when they're practicing or when they're in the studio, they are they're just hitting hitting the golf ball. They they aren't you know, there aren't consequences, which would be the kind of classic way of, of looking at it. But what what most people would do would be to look at, you know, would be to try and mitigate the consequences. So, you know, oh, I've, there's water down the right, we'll just block it out or don't think about it. Well, I don't know about you, but if you've ever tried to not think about something, good luck. 
Um, if you've ever tried to block out a thought, again, good luck. If you've ever tried to change a positive thought for a, for a negative, you know, a negative thought for a positive thought, well, you know, we, we know that we play our best golf when we're, you know, we're, we're reasonably clear. So how is more thinking going to, going to, going to get us in, you know, going to put us in, in a place where, you know, where we generally play our best golf. It just doesn't make sense. So what, what we need to look at is rather than looking outwards again at the consequences or at the, the uh, 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 techniques or coping strategies is to ask the question, well, you know, to whom, to whom does this matter? And it goes back to this, this, this belief that who we are is a finite, limited body mind. And if we believe that, then the story that we have in our head about that body mind and what will make that body mind happy, what will enhance that body mind, that will lead us to feeling anxious, which is a separation from the truth. The truth is who we really are is awareness. We are just awareness of the experience that, that we're having. And awareness cannot be enhanced or diminished by the nature of the experience that it that that has happened so you you if you have a you know you can you can try this for yourself if you shut your eyes your experience changes but the awareness of that experience is exactly the same and it's the same with a round of golf if you have a if you have a shoot 68 that's you know you, you that your ego would judge that that's a good experience if you shoot 88 your experience would judge that that's a bad ex- your, your your ego would judge that that's a bad experience but the awareness by which both of those experiences are known is exactly the same and and understanding that is the key to resilience because uh, a human being can't be resilient because a human being comes and goes. A human being is a thought, it's an experience. So how can something that comes and goes be resilient? What is resilient? What's permanent? What's, you know, infinite? What's untouchable is awareness. The awareness of that we have, that by which we know a good round of golf is the same as the awareness by which we know a bad round of golf. The awareness that we knew, that knew our experience when we were five years old is the same awareness by which we'll know our experience when we're 95 years old. So when we're looking to 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 understand how we feel from moment to moment, we have to the more we can realize that all we are is the awareness of experience. We're not what we believe ourselves to be in terms of this thought, feeling, perception, sensation of a body and a mind, the more chance we've got of actually playing to our potential and, and, and enjoying the experience that we're having. Very, very deep and great answer again. Thank you. Um, so Paul, perhaps we, um, I know there's a, I know you've got an action challenge for us. So I want to sort of be respectful of your time. Um, (laughs) I can talk about this stuff all day. So if you've got any more questions, keep going. Um, yeah, well, the, the action challenge, perhaps for the, the listeners who, something which you believe in or um, that you think that would greatly impact the listeners' lives, which is perhaps not maybe golf-related. It can be golf-related, um, but please fire away. It, it's, it's just pointing back to, to what I was saying before. It's, it's whenever you feel, whenever you have a feeling that you, that you, you know, your feelings are there for a reason. Your feelings are telling you something. Unfortunately, we, because of our conditioning, we always look outside and try and attribute our feelings to a cause and then fix the situation or circumstance that we believe is, is the cause of those feelings. Rather than doing that, whenever you have a feeling that you, you know, whether it's frustration, annoyance, anger, disappointment, sadness, turn back the other way and ask yourself who or what is it is 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 having this experience, you know, is, is the belief that you are something, the cause of that feeling rather than you seeing that there is just a feeling and there is 
you as in something which is aware of that feeling. So again, it's 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 ask yourself the question, what are you going to believe? Are you going to trust your beliefs or are you going to go with your direct experience? Because that to me is is the key to you know happiness in in whatever we do, whether it's golf, whether it's work, whether it's relationships. It's it's understanding the true nature of that experience. And if we can start to ask questions about that, rather than standing there with everybody else and cheering that the emperor's new, you know, new clothes look great. If, if, if you, you know, if you, if you don't see any clothes there, if you can see a hairy ass, then call it a hairy ass, take it for what it is, trust your direct experience rather than, rather than going with what everybody else is saying is true. I suppose that can uh, you can you can play that ball matter effect. So it could be like um, like a habit. So if I'm, I'm not a smoker, but say if someone was smoking, for example, a belief would be like I want to stop smoking. Um, but then uh, I also know about that belief that it that my experience from that belief is that it you know I don't want to do it any longer. It causes me to be feel sick, ill, blah blah. blah. I know it's bad for, bad for me. So I can trust my experience that what I feel like after that belief rather than the belief is just like more of a habit. Yeah. I, I would, I would go further than that though and ask who, who or what is, who or what is it that needs a cigarette? What, what is, who or what is suffering to the extent that they need something, anything in that, in that moment? The moment you do that, you are, you are completely present. You're not thinking about the future. You're not thinking about the past. You are present. And in the present moment, when we are present as as awareness, as consciousness, we do not need anything. That is the definition of happiness, is, is pure presence, is pure awareness, it's being. It's our true nature, it's who we really are. And in that moment, there is no thought of I need something or I want something of seeking or resisting. There is just presence. So, because you, you know, yeah. The future payoffs or, or the past. It, uh, yeah once. yeah you know the the what what is the desire for a cigarette it's the memory that at some point in time a cigarette made you feel better than you believe that you feel at the moment so you're in, you're in the past you know and if you're anticipating what that cigarette is going to taste like you're in the future whereas if you are present as as awareness rather than in the past or the future as a body and a mind, then in that moment, you don't need anything. You are, you are just you, you are, you are awareness and, and that. So it's, it's rather than, you know, as I say, it's, it's the same, you know, when you're, when you're nervous or when you're anxious, you know, asking yourself the question to, to whom does this matter is, is, is probably going to help you more than looking in the direction of of who or what is you believe is making you anxious and trying to mitigate that that's a beautiful way to to put it and that to sort of um wrap up i think and end on that beautiful moment i do before we end though i i know we could talk about perhaps we have to do round two at some point but there's um you, you sound like you're a very well read man as well as being an author is there any books uh book recommendations you have which perhaps are touching on these subjects and they could be goal focused or they could be outside of goal yep um so i'd recommend a, a couple of books um there's one author that i'm reading a lot of at the moment um a guy called bernardo castrup which is bernardo and then k-a-s-t-r-u-p um, his latest book is called The Idea of the World, um, which is Bernardo's a, um, he's a computer scientist. He's, um, used to work at, in the, at the, the CERN laboratory in Switzerland. So he's a, a physicist and a, and an engineer by trade. So he's a very, very intelligent chap, but he's, he's written a couple of of, of, I think he's written six books now, which point to um, what what we would call um, metaphysical idealism. This idea that the world is is mental rather than physical, and and he's great because he he looks at it from the physics point of view. So there's some interesting stuff in there around quantum physics. So if you're you know if your readers are of a more scientific rather than a more spiritual 
persuasion, then then Bernardo would be a great place to start with that. Um, the other book I'd re- recommend is called Perfume of Silence um, by a guy called Francis Lucille, um, who is one of the best teachers of what what this or some people call this understanding, which is non-duality. Um, I'd certainly recommend Francis's work. He's got some really good YouTube videos as well. So um, it's worth having a look at those. Fantastic. Uh, those are great. I will put them in the show notes for the listeners. And uh, any others you want before? No. Uh, another person I like listening to is is a guy called Rupert Spira, who is um, – who's an, uh, is an English philosopher, but uh, he's written some books as well. But again, it's worth having a look at. He's, he's very, very clear in his, in both in his understanding, the way that he communicates, it communicates what it is we're pointing to. So yeah, certainly, certainly recommend having a look at those guys. Okay. Amazing. I'll, I'll include them all. Um, actually, one more question before we wrap up. Um, yeah. You have, uh, what is the best hundred dollars or hundred pounds you've spent in terms of, uh, investment uh, personal gain in the last sort of three to five years that has greatly impacted or affected your life wow <laughs> um i spent 500 pounds on my dog daisy so um i would have to say a fifth of daisy would be the best 100 pounds that i've spent in the last um uh, yeah, whether it be the tail or the the head and the ears, I'm not quite so sure. But yeah, I'd say I'd say that, that five hundred for that. That, that. Yeah, a fifth a fifth of Daisy is my uh, yeah. That would be the best hundred pounds I've spent. And she allowed it. Where is it? Woman, you remember? Yeah, yeah. She comes on the golf course with me, and uh, she comes to to a lot of the meetings I do and the the training sessions that I do as well. So yeah, she's uh, she's great company and uh, a great pointer to to what it is to be uh, completely happy within your within your own skin. Amazing. What type of dog is it? She's a cock spaniel. Okay. So she's a little little golden cock spaniel. She's just curled up curled back up on the sofa next to me at the moment. So Amazing. yeah, very cool. Um, Sam, where can people uh, find you? Are you online? Do you have a website? Um, yep. So um, my my website is samdiamondgolf.com. Um, that's obviously the, the website that I that I um, that I do all my golf stuff on. Um, the the website that my myself and my colleagues have for the other work that we do in sports is called sportsprinciples.com. Um, there's lots of articles which go a little bit deeper into sort of team sports and uh, and how that plays out. Um, and then I'm also on Twitter as uh, at Sam Jarman Golf, so you can find me there as well. I, I, I like Twitter; it's probably my 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 addiction of choice, if you want to put it like that. Okay, amazing. Well, Sam, thank you so much for this, and um, I, I really think uh, we should do a round two soon, or we're in a couple of weeks or months, and and explore more of these subjects because I think there's there's so much more here. Especially, happy to. I think we have lots of questions from the listeners, <laughs> and we did into the deep end, as you said, which is good. Happy to, mate. And as I say, please, um, sorry, my email address as well is, uh, is sam at samjarmangolf.com. So if anybody does have any questions, obviously feel free to send them in to you, and either you can forward them on, or if people want to get in touch directly, that'd be great. Amazing. Cool. Thank you so much, Sam, and uh, we'll speak soon. Lovely. Thanks, Chris. Really appreciate it. Cheers. Thanks. Bye bye.